Welcome to this special episode of Free Voices from the nation's capital, Canberra. I'm John Storey, a research fellow with the Institute of Public Affairs. And today we have a very special guest, Casey Costello, the founding trustee of Hobson's Pledge, an organisation devoted to uniting all New Zealanders. Uh, we're in Canberra uh, for the last couple of days. We've been talking to, to politicians about the Institute of Public Affairs research on the voice to parliament and the New Zealand experience. And the last couple of days I've heard um, Casey talking about um, uh, her experiences in New Zealand and how they implemented things that Australia are looking to implement and, um, and, and some really passionate and, um, and uh, in, interesting conversations have been had. Um, but before we get into all that detail, um, Casey, tell us a little bit about your background and a, bit, a little bit about Hobson's Pledge. Okay. Um, yeah, so my background is um, first and foremost a New Zealander. I'm, I'm very proud of my combined ancestry of um, Anglo-Irish settlers that came to New Zealand in the 1860s and my Ngāpui heritage, which makes me a Northland Māori and um, descending from some um, impressive chiefs um, such as Tamati Wakanini and Patawini who were both signatories of the Treaty of Waitangi and I did my career as a police officer in South Auckland and, and was alarmed at seeing some of the worst situations um, that people can be in and, and felt that there was more that could be done and became more and more concerned about the number of Māori who were speaking um, advocating for better outcomes um, and claiming to speak for me, um, for all Māori, when they hadn't been given any mandate to do so. And then over the years, less and less positive outcomes were being delivered and we seemed to be going backwards rather than forwards. And that kind of escalated and um, by 2016, um, with a, um, a group of other you know, passionate New Zealanders who believed in a better future for all of us, um, we formed Hobson's Pledge and um, since then we've been advocating for um, equality before the law, um, a, a, a nation that um, has one of the proudest democratic histories in the world. We were the first to give women the vote, um, Māori had voting rights in 1867, um, so we were a pretty impressive heritage and we seem to have gone backwards since then um, and that's, you know, you've seen the and in your research how bad things have got for us yeah we um we were sort of inspired to look at the new zealand experience by our prime minister anthony albanese who in in 2020 held up new zealand as a beacon for indigenous reconciliation and said we should follow the new zealand path and and we thought that um, we would investigate exactly what that means and that's how we we, we came across yourself, I mean, what has um, the decades of, of reconciliation and, 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 and activism in this space created in New Zealand? Um, so the, the experience in New Zealand has grown to the point that all of the good intention, which is exactly what you're being sold in The Voice, um, this pathway to reconciliation, the opportunity to um, address past grievances, was why the tribunal was a mechanism was established and that was really important to us that we had this mechanism that we would see an end you know an end point that this would you know we'd finally get the resolutions and we would move forward and the tribunal was established on that basis um, and what we've reached now is the tribunal has now become a mechanism by which um, it's become a power play and we have become um, rather than a democracy, um, we're heading to an ESMO national stage. So, so we are no longer New Zealanders. We are two ethnic identities, and and what's the division that's occurring is is sad, and it's and outcomes have been lost. We, we we're not concerned. It's a power play, and it's become um, a, a, an infrastructure of a kind of. Um, and I hate to use the term elite, but it was like the self-appointed group that claimed to represent us, who um, 
are unaccountable, they're not elected, there is no consequence for failure to deliver, um, but instead of addressing that, we just do more of it, and, and we've gone further down the path of division. And, and those outcomes have become so devoid of tangible benefits. Um, you know, the reparation, even the reparation model has failed because the reparation, it's never enough. Mm. And, and we've seen it in our history. We have multiple settlements for the same grievances. So, you know, a, a settlement that may have occurred in the 1800s has been resettled in the early 1930s and then resettled again in the 60s and, and then under the tribunal come back again. So, and, and even those reparations are deemed to be a bit of an insult. Mm. You know, oh, we're getting 12 cents in the dollar, an arbitrary figure, but, mm. you know, we're getting 12 cents in the dollar to what was actually taken off us. So rather than um, building bridges and allowing us to move forward, we've just created further resentment and anger because it's not enough or it hasn't achieved what you promised it was going to achieve. Um, and that's putting aside all of the other mechanisms that have come in place, which are just ridiculous treaty initiatives. Yeah, go, going through the, the decisions of the Waitangi Tribunal over decades, early on, there was almost a sense that oh, there are 26 outstanding claims and we've dealt with 18 and almost felt like this could be the end yeah. of a process yeah. because you know, there, have, there have been wrongdoing in the past. Then the dis decisions became more and more obscure. Um, claims were being made that had only the most tangential connection to, 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 to Maori culture or or something, and we've talked about some of these, you know, we need radio wave frequency licenses to, to protect the Maori language and, 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 and Maori health outcomes aren't as good, so we need to get the first dibs on COVID vaccines. And, and they're more and more um, almost feel like they're, it's an organisation looking for grievances <laughs> and, and creating new ones. Yeah, and creating a victimhood, which is the dangerous part. And, and the saddest thing you can do is rob our young people of a future by saying that you are somehow disadvantaged purely only on, on, the, on your ethnicity, on your ancestry, that you are a victim of events that unfolded 200 years ago. And at no point have, have we or any New Zealanders denied that reparation should be paid to address wrongs and, and to allow us to move forward. And we have an impressive Māori, probably the greatest leader we've seen in New Zealand, Sir Aparana Nata, and, and he gave a, you know, an, an impressive speech in 1940 to celebrate the 100th year anniversary of the signing of the treaty. And one of his foundation statements in that speech was that if it were not for the Treaty of Waitangi, we would not have a free Māori people alive today. Mm. He recognised the fact that our history wasn't just about the damage by co colonialism, but by our own um, aggression and violence towards each other, and that that treaty brought peace amongst Māori as well as um, um, between Māori and the settlers. So mm. it wasn't, you know, that the, the distortion of history and then what he was advocating and what we still advocate to this day is the opportunity to move forward, to look forward, to build a better future. And, and to my mind, this is just lazy solution finding that we will divide our citizenship by race. And, and it's the, the, at the foundation, which is what I fear for Australia, is it undermines your democracy. It determines that you have a two people nation and one of those people has different rights to the other people and their rights would be, um, you know, without any guarantee that it's going to deliver better outcomes, you're differentiating, you have two peoples in a nation and your foundation of a democracy is that every single person has the same right to be heard and when you change that, you, there's no going back and, and whether you're saying um, in New Zealand's case, we talk about manahiri and tangata whenua, and manahiri are visitors, and tangata whenua as the people of the land. And to suggest that people, you know, little kids mm. in school at five years old are being told that they're manahiri mm. or they're tangata whenua, 
and that's the saddest thing you can tell a young person, that you're depriving them of their nation, you're telling them that they're a visitor to this country. And, and I see the similarity when you talk about first people and second yeah. people nation. Well, well yesterday, one of the, the politicians who we, we got the opportunity to, to brief, um, the term First Nation has become popular in, in Australia to, to describe Indigenous people. And at, at a church service, of all things, um, this politician was recalling to us that they referred to First Nations and Second Nations. Yeah. He being yeah. <laughs> one of the members of the Second Nation and just the divisiveness yeah. that that um, suggests. And, and we're putting this into our constitution. Yeah, and, and that's the differential. Like we, we've put it into legislation um, and, and that hasn't you know, been enough. It's, it's gone further than that. Um, and it starts to gain momentum, which was what we've seen in New Zealand. So what starts off as a good intention um, shifts into a, a dangerous ground where it's now there's never enough and there's more required. And, and in New Zealand, the, 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 the victims, the losers in all this, are the people who are most in need. And, and one of the political parties in New Zealand sums it up really well, and, and that's the ACT Party and David Seymour, who is in himself Māori, who says that this foundation is that all Māori are in need and all people in need are Māori, and that's not the case. This is the fact that not all Māori are in need and not all those in need are Māori. Mm. So you ignore the people who are in need. And then what, what, what creates in the middle of this is this hostility, this anger on both sides. And, and when your Prime Minister says we're leading the way in reconciliation and we are a guiding light, you know, we, we did some um, you know, scientific polling last year that you know, 72% of New Zealanders said we are more divided than we were a year ago. Now that's yeah. astonishing. In a country that's being advocated as, you know, we're on the right path, we have become um, so divided and that we are, you know, choosing to identify ourselves not by our citizenship but by our ethnicity. We have to somehow qualify to speak. Mm. And that's the saddest thing. And then the, the hostility goes even further because the, the, the concept of race has shifted into, it's not, it's not that our ethnicity combines us, it's, it's our political beliefs around that ethnicity. Yeah. So we have ministers of the Crown saying that if you don't agree with how I advocate, then you must be a useless Māori. Mm. And this is a minister of the Crown calling other MPs useless race because they don't agree and that's the level of conflict we've got to. Um, we have a, an, an, an MP who has amazing credentials in terms of she you know, was grew up in the, in the foster care system, um, she has a Cambodian husband, she was advocating in the house about children's rights and a Māori MP from the other side accused her of seeing the world through a vanilla lens. Mm. Now, rather than debating the issue, which is vulnerable children, he turned it into a race debate. And that's the type of things that we're seeing. Yeah, we have some similar problems in Australia. You, you met Jacinta Price um, yesterday, um, or, or th through the last few days, and um, she has some different views to, to, to other Indigenous activists, and some of the vitriol. Um, um, that she has had to endure. Um, it's almost as if she's a sort of race traitor because she dares to, to, mm. to, to speak her mind in a, in a different way. It, it's really the, the sort of the toxic outcome of identity politics that yeah. if you look at everything through a racial prism, then, then you sort of expect conformity with certain groups yeah. and and those that don't quite conform to that feel doubly marginalised, you know. Yeah. They're told they're, they're victims by society, but even their own their own people, yeah. um, they don't seem to get along with. Um, we, we probably should just be treating everyone as individuals, which... And, and that's yeah. the foundation of your democracy. That, that's the part. 
and and this argument that oh you're a minority so therefore you know your voice won't be as strongly heard now there is no nation in the western world that wants bad outcomes for the most in need i mean yeah. we as societies are, are measured by how we treat our most vulnerable mm. but to suggest and this is a common theme that comes through that um only Māori can speak for Māori's mm. needs and only Aboriginals can speak for Aboriginal needs and, and that we all somehow speak the same voice denies us of our individuality. And at our core as people, we want to earn a decent living, we want to be able to have education, we want health, so it, it doesn't differentiate based upon race. Mm. Now how we achieve those problems might, might differ but they differ based upon community and family. They're not mm. differentiated by a government intervention. They are differentiated by, so that the model is empowerment of individuals, and yet by the very attacks that you have, um, that you, you aren't allowed to be an individual. You aren't allowed to say your thinking. And I think the difference between the likes of Senator Price or you know, politicians in New Zealand is those who truly advocate for better outcomes do not start their conversations as if they speak for all people. Mm. What they start their conversations with is, I want better outcomes, and mm. this is not a mechanism by which better outcomes will be achieved. And I think that's the differential that, that you have to go by. When you go down a path of a voice, your assumption is that every voice of that ethnicity will be thinking the same things, and they won't be. And you'll have individuals who are more powerful than others speaking louder than others, and then you're left with whose voice do you listen to? Because mm. if it's not one voice, then all you've done is created a whole lot of bureaucracy mm. and an immense amount of cost, which all New Zealand can attest to, without achieving one better outcome. And and that bureaucracy does everything to detach those who you're trying to reach from the system because they get confused as well from well who do I talk to and who, who's going to represent me and um, and and that that need um, you know democracy might not be perfect but it's better than any of the other systems as, yeah. as Winston Churchill famously <laughs> said you know it's, so it, it's that you know accountability the ability to kick out those who don't do a good job is the only way you can assure that you will improve outcomes, is there has to be accountability. And, and this well-meaning idea of, you know, we'll listen, um, you know, this time, and to suggest that it's not going to end up in your courts, that it's not going to end up as legislation, is naive to the extreme. Mm. Because when you create an expectation, which is exactly what New Zealand did, that we will listen to you and you will get better outcomes, and when they felt the, the, the voice wasn't being listened to and there were not better outcomes, we ended up in court. And now we have massive amounts of consultants and lawyers getting incredibly wealthy in what has become a treaty industry. Mm. It, and it truly is an industry. This is millions and millions of dollars in, in settlement processing and settlement hearings and, and this concept of you know colonisation and all this. We are further away from resolving these issues than we were 40 years ago when the tribunal was set up. Yeah, I think um, perhaps sometimes unfairly there is a perception of that in, in Australia, that there's an, an Aboriginal lobby, there's an Aboriginal industry and, and they're sort of, you know, um, extracting benefits for their own uh, uh, benefit um, from the government, from the system, from taxpayers. And that sometimes can be a bit unfair because I think that there yeah. are Indigenous communities that really do need yeah. help. And, and I guess that's part of this sort of... But, but it's such a divisive process that you can actually start to maybe become a bit unsympathetic to the real needs yeah. in the community because you, you start to feel a little bit it's us and them. Or oh, well, they've got their voice, they've got their politicians who are running around... Um, making headlines I, I don't need to care about yeah. those Australians because they've got their own voice yeah. um, which is I think a, a really huge step back yeah, yeah and that that's the part that I think that division component which is you know they're already getting so much stuff 
But when you look at why that's not making a change, you'll find that there's this whole layer of bureaucracy that's buffering and, and preventing individual opportunity. And that's all you can guarantee as a nation. You can only provide a quality of opportunity. You cannot deliver a quality of outcome. There's too yeah. many differentials. And, and what you need to do is make sure that there is definite accountability for what's being delivered and what's being given. And the other component, which, which we've seen in New Zealand, which will likely be the case here, is that when you, when you create this, um, you know, this voice mechanism or this anonymity stuff, and you go, okay, you guys, you know, you tell us what you want. You devolve responsibility and accountability for those elected to represent those communities from having to deliver. Because you now said, well, I don't have to, do, exactly as you said, I don't have to do anything anymore because, you know, I've given them their voice and I've given mm, them this. Yeah. What you should be doing is increasing accountability for the elected to deliver better outcomes, not separating it out. And that, that idea that, you know, you, you sit over there and, you know, talk to those people and we don't have to worry about you. Is, is one of the failures that we see is that there has to be greater accountability and the best accountability mechanism is your democracy and and once you put this in your institution it will impact your democracy there's yeah. no way it won't and and that's the at, at its core the thing that is the most protection you can you can give those in need is the ability to vote out those who don't deliver what needs to be delivered yeah, in Australia, we've we've had um, a crisis in in Central Australia. Um, there's been some flip flopping between different um, ideas on what to do with alcohol in in, in remote communities, um, and the reintroduction of, of, of alcohol has caused some terrible um, uh, uh, situation in in Alice Springs and elsewhere, and. I mean, the politicians, I think, who make the decisions should be the ones held accountable. But I, I can fully see that, well, we got advice from The Voice, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. and so it's really not our fault as a way to sort of almost, you know, pass the buck on some of these yeah. things that really our elected politicians are accountable for spending the money and making the laws. The buck should stop with them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's we. There was a really interesting debate we went through recently about the legalising of cannabis, and it was quite a you know a stark reality when you had on one side of the table um, the likes of Helen Clark and you know sitting there arguing about why why cannabis should be legalised and we should have these little dope shops and it all be fine and and and, and Māori won't get arrested as much because we'll be legalising cannabis, and then you had on the other side of the bench people who were living in South Auckland and experiencing it and saying, no, you're, you're saying that you want to further impoverish our people because yeah. you're going to make it easier for them not to get arrested, but uh, harder for them to be arrested, but easier for them to get the stuff that is damaging their lives and their families and their opportunities to succeed. Yeah. And because we saw it in, in liquor stores, you know, they, they made liquor stores in every single corner in South Auckland. And, and it became easier and easier to get alcohol and it became easier and easier. And that was exactly what was going to happen in the dope shops. So it was a stark differential with the mal well-meaning people on one side going, then you won't get arrested. And the other people going, in the reality of our communities, that's not right. <laughs> that's not going to be a solution. So it's, it's that ability to be heard and make the elected accountable and um, and that's the part that you've got to get this balance, and and it's this wishy washy sort of you know um, who's going to be who's who's going to be the voice yeah. that'll be allowed to speak, and that's where you get the complications. You know, if you have Senator Price saying one thing, yeah. but we don't want to listen to your voice. Yeah. Well, whose whose voice whose voice holds the most water? Who's who's the one that's going to be able to be able to say categorically? And, and that's the part that got me motivated, was when you have people standing up going, I speak for Māori, and you go, well, hang on. <laughs> yeah, as if there's one voice, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's, yeah. And, and we have individual needs. 
And the knock-on effect then is that you get really dangerous legislation and you get really dangerous social policy and stuff like you know how we've seen with you know water control. So we've now got the position where you know the legislation has been passed to take water out of public ownership you know with the councils, um, transfer it into these massive entities, business entities um, that will have 50% council or local government elected representation <laughs> and 50% unelected iwi representation. Mm. So 50% control of water handed over and and this wasn't even anything that was campaigned on. Yeah. This was just something that came out of um, you know a Labour government that was a majority government um, and you know we've now got this position where potentially under this legislation um, Māori will get water royalties from um, the the use of water and I mean that's a necessity of life component mm. and you've handed it to an unelected entity you know that that's um, and, you know, dangerous. And, and this is part of that co-governance yeah, in, this in co -governance New Zealand um, you might want to explain a bit about that but as, as I sort of understand it it's it's I mean I, the, the way I describe it is it's creating two nations in one yeah. And in this case, it's well. There's a there's a resource to be managed, so it's going to be jointly managed. Yeah. On the basis of race, yeah. you know. Yeah. There's Mary will have a half say, and non Mary will have a half. Uh, they have the other yeah. half say, um, and there's no accountability. And it, I mean, the maths doesn't work. You know, the, the Mary are, are about fifteen percent of the population. So t tell us a bit more about co-governance and, yeah. and what it is, and and, and I think yeah. the relevance to the, it's it's kind of this progression as you you will experience. I think is that we have the tribunal, which was the mechanism to kind of you know resolve this redress, and then that move forward like that we we now create other mechanisms to you know support this redress, and so co-governance kind of came into part of the treaty settlements so you know we'll jointly manage you know a, a river or a, you know those sort of things now they haven't been successful despite a lot of the government saying that oh these co-governance models have been highly successful they haven't been and, and we can cite examples of why they haven't been successful but building on that idea of co-governance this current government then brought in this idea that we can expand that model um, and that came not from treaty settlements, that came from government-driven legislation that said, you know, we will co-govern. And, and that's effectively saying we have a democratically elected government and another entity, and, and they're going to co-govern in public services, and which is exactly what we've done with the creation of a Māori Health Authority. Our, our public health system mm. is co-governed. So there is a Māori Health Authority and Health New Zealand mm. and they both report to the Minister and they both have the ability to determine what they want but you, know, you can dress it up every which way you like. Effectively the Māori Health Authority will have the ability to prevent Health New Zealand doing things if they don't agree that it advances the, the um, requirements of Māori Health. Now, as you, you quoted with the COVID thing, when, when they felt that the COVID vaccine rollout was disadvantaging Māori because Māori die younger, um, they changed the way um, the vaccine was rolled out um, based upon race and, and not on need, not on your medical criteria. And that's what's occurring. So we've shifted down this path of co-governance um, and the current government has now been pushed into a corner because they're saying, well, what does it actually mean? Define it. Mm -hmm. um, and like The Voice, there's no clear definitions. There's no clear clarity around what mm -hmm. that's actually going to mean, how it's actually going to operate, how the accountability is going to be managed, how the different iwi that will make up this 50% governance will, will select their representation. All of those sort of things are just, you know, oh, yeah, we'll worry about that later. We'll get the legislation over the line, and we'll talk about it later. This is water, you know. This is, <laughs> yeah. and 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 that's the type of stuff. And 
then we went further with, you know, we've got the Māori Health Authority, we've got the water control, um, we've got, you know, concepts around, you know, local government and how local government will be structured, um, all of this stuff. Um, and, and then because we've, we've built on this model of we're a partnership, um, we'll now look at the United Nations Declaration for Indigenous Rights and how we're going to um, realise that plan and that declaration, how we're going to realise that in our country. So we've now gone to the next level of, well, you know, how do we make sure that this has occurred? So we've got you know, now a third layer of you know, race-based representation to ensure that we're meeting all these criteria. So this is the complexity that comes when you say, we'll do better, and they say, you're not doing better, so we do more, and okay. you're still not doing good enough, and we'll do more. Um, and nobody stops and goes, hang on, this isn't working, we should look at another model. We just keep doing more, and we've become a divided nation as a result. I'm conscious of your, your time, you've been very generous with your time. Um, there was one um, case from the Waitangi Tribunal that's in our research that I thought you might have a unique perspective on given your background as a as a police officer in a you know as I understand a pretty rough 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 neck of Auckland, of Auckland. Um, and it it feeds into some of what we're talking about that this voice to parliament and some of these processes are very much a top down process yeah. we were in parliament house yesterday it's it's an artificial environment it's the politicians are treated like these godly figures walking around with all their their aids, and and that does create, I think, a, a mentality of they know best. Um, and the voice to parliament will be filled with with politicians. So there's, there's there's no there's no doubt about that. Um, and so there was a, a case that dealt with um, Maori incarceration rates, and 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 the rates are concerning, uh, and. And they're dreadful in Australia as well. It, it, it is a national shame, our, our Indigenous incarceration rates. And, and this, this case of the Waitangi Tribunal looked at it. And look, I was really flabbergasted by this case. Um, everyone wants to improve the outcomes. But it was a completely top-down, imposed process. It didn't, I, it didn't look at causes at all. It didn't look at real solutions. The case simply said that the Justice Department, New Zealand Justice Department, a relevant department, needs to have targets in which to reduce Maori incarceration rates. Um, to facilitate that, we will do treaty-based thinking and treaty awareness training, um, which is sort of quite Orwellian sounding sort of political indoctrination and that the department must be held accountable for not meeting the targets. Yeah. There was nothing in there about what are the root causes, root causes. Yeah. how do we deal with that. It was purely, it's the fault of the government, it's a breach of the Waitangi Treaty that this is happening and so the government must reduce the rates. Yeah. Now to me, um, that can only be achieved by either treating the same crimes differently depending on your race yeah. or and or releasing or failing to incarcerate or failing to incarcerate as long violent criminals yeah i mean as a police officer how's that going to work yeah and it was it was more abhorrent than that because what we we, we kind of created an um what, what they call, there's a, a name for it, but it effectively is an alternative um, resolution process for criminal prosecutions. And when it started, it was to deal with a certain type of crime. So it was not to deal with violent crime, it wasn't to deal with domestic violence, it wasn't, and you had the ability to effectively go to um, almost a, you know, a marae, which is um, a, like a cultural you know, centre mm. for, for the Maori tribe. and and you had these alternate resolution processes where you had victims having to go to marae to have their case heard because that was the, this alternate resolution thing to avoid people having to go to prison. So they were looking at alternate outcomes. Now what's occurred is that um, because the targets weren't being met, the criteria under which you were 
um, eligible for this alternative means of justice expanded. And so police were then put into the position of you had to say why it shouldn't go to alternative justice rather than why it should, why it qualified. So they were forcing more and more. Then we had a commissioner of police who went on public record saying the police were systemically racist um, and we, we suffered from institutional racism. So therefore we were um, tainted. You were disempowered as police officers. It would be a horrible time to be a police officer now because we stopped looking at exactly that, the root causes. What can we do um, you know, to, to, to achieve better outcomes and so that there's less crime being committed? And as you can see in New Zealand at the moment, we are on a crime, um, we've got the highest levels of violent crime we've seen worse, in forever. Yeah. Um, and youth crime is significantly high and really blatant, middle of the day, ram raids through jewellery shops type crime. And no consequence because these are all youth offenders. And that, that lack of, you know, clever thinking as to better outcomes. We're just not looking at root causes at all. Um, and we just labelled it all as racism. And that's the danger. That's the real problem, is that you devoid responsibility for actually looking at causes and coming up with solutions because you label everything under this race umbrella. And the only people that are going to be harmed are the people who are victims of crime, the vulnerable young, the poor, they're the ones that suffer whilst we all sit in exactly as you say the ivory towers going this will be good for them and 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 they they won't get hurt casey thank you so much for your time and thank you for for for, for bucking the trend um standing up to what can be quite a mob-like mentality of people who speak their mind on un um, uncomfortable topics um, I hope you've enjoyed your stay yeah, here in Canberra nice. and in, a, in Australia. Um, thank you so much for your, t for your time. Thank you very much.